we've heard four very different speeches. I think it was really interesting to hear very different perspectives here. We have two roving mics, and we'd like to hear from you with any questions or any comments. Um, or also, join, you can join our, on Slido with, with any, any other perspectives. So, yeah, we have some. Start from there, from Natalino. You have a mic, Nat. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Natalino Fenech. I used to be a journalist for a long time. I worked with Herman for a long time, with Daphne. Sadly, yes. <laughs> um, I could see Herman squirm when, uh, when uh, the last speaker with, uh, was, was, uh, was speaking, when Claire was speaking about racism. And uh, racism here is rife. Unfortunately, I don't have time to, to comment about this, but I'll, I'll parallel about, talk about a parallel issue which Ricardo raised, which is contempt. Um, contempt for journalists is rife in Malta, too. Um, and contempt isn't just because the Prime Minister didn't go to Daphne's memorial. Uh, the contempt to witness every day while ministers are entering parliament, and uh, I make an exception here for, for Everest Bartolo, who was a long time minister and who was one of the few who didn't do this. But if you watch news and you see journalists trying to get answers from ministers, very often ministers just brush by journalists as if no one is there. And I think this is causing a lot of contempt because if ministers are setting the examples journalists are not even worth speaking to, then what is the message that's being sent to the people who are writing Times Bigilla News on Facebook all the time? So whenever the Times raised, writes, puts a story on, 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 shares a story on Facebook, somebody from the Times, um, somebody writes, Bigilla, Bigilla and Maltese is, is, is a kind of bean pate. It's quite tasty, actually, but it has negative connotation. So when they say Bigilla News, it's not, it's not positive. And the first one writes Bigilla News, and then it's downhill all the way from there, you know, and everybody's taking, you know, time's rubbish, time's this, time's that, whatever. So this contempt rubs off, and it's not just journalists now. I mean, this morning I was, I was on a site where, where people are comparing prices, and somebody published two receipts of, of things bought from Lidl in Sicily and things bought from Lidl in Malta. And Lidl in Sicily is apparently 30 to 40% cheaper than Malta. And instead of people saying, Lidl are ripping us off, people were saying, go live in Sicily, they have transport costs. So, you know, we've lost the ability to tell right from wrong. We've lost the ability to, to doubt, as Varist uh, so, so, so perfectly said. Thank you. Thank you, Natalino. You know, um, this is a very good point, actually. You know, sometimes me as a journalist and, and as an editor, I, I feel I'm being drowned out by the nonsense out there. And I would like to think that the majority of people in my country are just not full of hateful trolls. And it's very disheartening to work in this industry. When you are there, asking any minister, asking any authority legitimate questions, and it starts from the Begilla news, as Natalino says, and it's downhill from there. And no wonder why we sometimes cannot find any journalists, because the hate out there is unbelievable. But there's one thing I'd like to point out. Um, there are a lot of you know, people who think people who, are, uh, who know this is wrong, this trolling is wrong, and yet we refuse to speak out on social media because we're scared. Because we're scared that the right-wingers are going to come on to us before sticking up to that black person who has been, you know, um, strip-searched, uh, you know, beaten up outside clubs. And we don't speak about it because we're scared. And I can't understand this in a country where we think uh, we take freedom of speech almost for granted. So we are, there's a lot of self-censorship. So thank you, Natalino, for starting off that. Yeah? Any? Yeah? Yeah. Hi. So just a question about this. We're, we're talking, I mean, for me, the, the news and the technology that you use to disseminate it starts and ends with people. And you said about trolls. How do you know the troll is even a person? It could be a bot that is then controlled by the other. I mean, Alex mentioned surveillance capitalism, which is the work by Susanna Zuboff, if people are interested in Harvard. Really good work. But we need to dig a little bit deeper and ask a few more critical questions, I would think, of the, of the you know, I've got, I've got son, the age of the people here that sat forward. But we're not actually talking about who owns TikTok, who actually then, even when you enter your content, who mediates that by use of algorithms. We've talked about racism. The algorithms are promoting this. They're actually feeding into the statistics and the algorithmic tools, the metals that I research, and they're actually creating this hereditary bias. Why? Because they're using the data sets that we've collected over the last few years and just 
automating that inequality. So I wonder if, uh, as journalists, which I'm not, who are investigating this style? Like, who owns the technology that is actually shaping some of the news that you put in? And do you go back and check and see if algorithms are interfered or whether the algorithmic bots are actually changing the shape of the news that you wish to report? Because that's also a big threat to, to what you're doing and freedom of speech and the power that you're talking about. It's like, who has this power if we strip it back? Sean, Claire, do you want to comment about that? Sure. Um, I think uh, what we've noticed in the last year, I think probably the one of the most well-established of the, the new platforms that have come about in the last um, decade or so is with YouTube. Um, for whenever we uh, put our content up there, um, that they now have what I would consider the equivalent of standards and practices that uh, has been long established with um, cable television in that w I can see you shaking your head, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, just in terms of uh, more and more of our content being uh, age restricted um, so that you have to log in and verify that you're, you're uh, 18 um, to, to watch it based on things like um, specifically, you know, um, very graphic content that would come from uh, the field in, in Ukraine. Um, we've also found that when we're discussing misinformation and disinformation in uh, US politics, that simply because of the words, those words being used within inside the report, that therefore uh, an age restriction has been put on. Uh, those films as well. So it is um, definitely restricting uh, who can see the, the work there. I think newer platforms have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, content moderation. Um, we know there's substantial changes happening at Twitter at the moment and the ramifications of those departures uh, there on uh, what people are allowed to uh, tweet at will and freely and um, what that means for uh, the legitimacy of that um, uh, entity as a as a platform. Yeah, if I can if I can just come back on that, um, is Rachel O'Connell here yet um, from Trust Elevate? So I think we can testify that there's not always a very safe way to check who the age of the person or to verify it that's currently on all of the platforms, including YouTube. Would that be fair to say? So I think that would certainly be a question I would have as well. Like yeah, and, all, and also beyond that, if you think about virtual competition, that um, all the large big tech companies, so Gaffer, people probably know mm. what I mean by Gaffer, etc., and Microsoft, they're frenemies. So, for instance, Google will pay companies over a million pounds to ensure where they are in the search list and how prominent their things are. So. Um, there's, you talk about responsibility. You know, if this was true, why do we need corporate social responsibility or corporate digital responsibility? Because human behavior underpins this. What we must do, like you say, as journalists and humans on this planet, and what we do do are two different things. If you think about what we should do to remain healthy, for instance, we know what we must do, but, you know, we're going to have a break where there's lots of cakes and biscuits, so we'll eat them and then go, damn, should have gone to the gym. So there's lots of things when you're thinking about people don't necessarily go out to be bad, um, like yourself, but we've got to think broader around the technology and who who is using this and for what, and the questions become very different at that level. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's you know substantial conversations around the ownership of TikTok and then the data storage from what what, what happens on that platform, um, and and that is uh, an on, uh, ongoing and evolving conversation, but is something that is certainly should be as prominent as it possibly can be um, in the process. Um, this, before we get to Ricardo, there's one question there addressed to you. Do you have a system of measuring the trolling and the attacks uh, around journalists? No, we, we measure uh, the reported threats from journalists, so it's clearly um, increasing. Um, mainly female journalists, you know. It's, it's really clear that we, yeah. we, we, we have a trend, you know, a, a growing trend of... Because it's, it's really easy. And coming back to, to your question, because I, I want to say something about this, you know, it's, it's really one of the challenges for your generation, is to ensure, I would say, to democratize these um, online tools, which are today misused by trolls, but also by governments, by those in power, you know, to frame um, the, the, the debate, the public debate, the public opinion, 
So it's, it's a real threat on democracy, and I, I really believe it's urgent to take measures to ensure more transparency from these algorithms, which are manipulated sometimes, or uh, as, as you said, uh, you can pay you know, to be more visible on, on, on these uh, networks, which is not the case. As journalists, we are supposed to, uh, it's not always the case, but we are supposed to uh, apply uh, ethics. You know, we, 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 we have uh, ethics, we are supposed to work in the public interests. Um, and now we have these new actors in, in the media system, which are the online platforms, providing news. They are news providers. If you look at the, at the figures, you know, f for many people, it's, it's the main source of news. But these tools are not regulated as we are in the media sector, as traditional media. Yeah. We have uh, independent regulators in every single country, you know, checking how you work, if you respect the conditions or the... And um, that's, that's for me the, the main challenge for your generation, to ensure that these tools, which are now so important in our lives, so important to provide news, are more transparent, are working uh, in the public interest and, and not uh, in, in some private, unknown or secret interests. Thank you. There are quite a few questions here, which is fantastic to see. I, 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 love, I love this. And the fact that there's so many comments coming in, that means that there, there is engagement. It's a pity this section is... We don't have much time for. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sorsha. I'm from the Guardian Foundation. My question's for Sean. Sorry, you're being put on the spot today, Sean. That's all right. Um, so during, well, at the beginning of the war and still now, there was loads of um, dis and misinformation being shared on TikTok, as I'm sure you're very aware. And I'm going to be talking later about how we help young people distinguish between these sources, particularly online. But I was wondering what you do as advice to distinguish yourself from the fake information that's out there. And do you have any concerns about how the algorithm works and could show someone who's browsing Vice on TikTok could then immediately show them something that's completely false with not that much differentiation between them. Like, do you have any thoughts or feelings about that? I definitely have had user feedback on, on TikTok just in terms of um, when scrolling through uh, accounts that they follow, then the algorithm has just thrown in something entirely random that um, sort of distorts the user experience. Um, it is definitely a problem because, you know, the more advanced that uh, those who want to spread disinformation uh, become will try and just mimic and look like. We've seen that, I think, in, in Facebook in particular um, around the uh, 2016 election where they will present themselves as legitimate news outlets and, and uh, legitimate news output as well. Um, there's only so much that the journalists can do, and that is still a great uh, burden of work. Um, but the platform providers themselves need to uh, ensure that content moderation and user verification and content verification is at the forefront of what they're doing, and it's not just about um, the bottom line uh, for them. Um, in terms of your first question and uh, video and whatnot that we would get through TikTok and then uh, other platforms as well, um, Typically, because our focus, if we're, if we're covering a story like that, we would not want to do that as a, what I would have called at Al Jazeera an in-house package or an agency wrap or whatever, just taking material that is on certain platforms and uh, forming a story out of that. We want to go and we have nothing in the can. We will spend two weeks on the ground filming. And I think we place great onus on that as a concept for news gathering still at this, because it's very expensive to do so, um, because we see the value in hearing from people uh, on the ground living the experience, but also it helps us navigate the difficult difficulties that come with um, those platforms and information that can be just impossible to verify as a journalist in the time frame that we need or we have to, to turn around something for publication. Okay, some more questions. There, I've saw lots of hands there. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's because sorry, I have sorry. the microphone for the longest time. I'm so sorry. Um, my name is Julia, and first I would like to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I'm from Brazil, so I guess at this point I get a veterans discount when it comes to fake news, disinformation, <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, my question, which is more like a point that I would like to hear some insights on, is. Um, with the two latest elections that we saw, the United States and now Brazil, we saw a big um, 
young people came together, Gen Z came together in Brazil, it was the first time they were able to vote. Um, and both um, Trump and Bolsonaro were um, taken out of power in Brazil by the slightest margin. But at the same time, the, the new presidents, which are Biden and Lula, are 79 and 77 year olds. Um, and here in the, the anonymous questions that we see, we see a lot of um, questions being like, does Gen Z know the power that they have? Does they, Gen Z know what they can do, the <coughs> responsibilities that they have? Um, you all talked about that, um, how we engage with social media, how we engage with fake news, how we engage with disinformation. Do, do you believe that in the end of the day, you, all of media in general, is putting a lot of weight on shoulders of people who actually don't have, we're not the editors of BBC, we are not the editors of CNN, none of us are gonna be presidents for the next 20 years. So the real power, the hard power, is not in our hands. And then you have all this responsibility of engaging with social media, when in the end of the day, specifically in Latin America, we do know that fake news, disinformation is more spread by boomers, and the way they engage with WhatsApp, the way we engage with Facebook. So you, um, again, I'm not saying you specifically, but all those conferences say young people, information, how to do that. What about older people and information? How do they deal with that? You know? Mm. Sorry. As the veteran of uh, Maltese politics, can I, no, I, I th address I think, the question? I think the issues that you raise are in a bigger perspective of, and it's a worrying trend, young people being disconnected from the democratic process. And I think this is one of the big problems that mainstream politicians and mainstream political parties have to face. And what is worrying is that there are electoral systems that permit mainstream political parties to disregard the increasing number of young people who are disengaging from the democratic process. And, and that is, I think, what needs to be addressed. And I wonder, I wonder whether we should bring in compulsory voting to make political parties not take for granted and ignore those who don't want to vote. We have compulsory voting, and it's the exact proportion. 0.9% of Brazilians are of the age of 16 to 18, and that's the exact margin that Lula won for Bolsonaro, 0 0.85 and 0 0.95 people are of the age of 16 and 18, and voting is compulsory in Brazil. So, so if, if, if you can get rid of Bolsonaro through compulsory voting, let's bring it to <laughs> Uh, but then I think, apart from that, the new this new situation of the of social media does give more power to, to young people communicating among themselves and to, to be active. And I think not all is lost. I think even if we follow what happened yesterday in the midterm elections, a lot of Trump candidates got defeated. <laughs> so, so, you know... Uh, the most important thing is to be skeptical and to, and to be active, but not to become cynical. Don't, don't, don't follow us and don't believe what we say, but look at what we do. Can I just add something really quickly on sure. that? Um, I, I do agree with what you're saying. I think there's a, a danger that I don't even know what generation I am. I get, get it very confused. <laughs> I really, I want to be a millennial. Inside, I'm a millennial. Um, but, you know, there is a sense that actually, you know, this generation, these generations, are essentially washing our hands of the problems that we've created. <laughs> Just saying, hey, Gen Z, it's all on you. You're going to sort it out. Climate change, you're going to do it. You know, it, it's too much for any one generation to, to take on. And I think perhaps there is something in the way we're communicating around these issues, that, that these are still shared responsibilities. And what these older generations are saying is, you know, we are complicit, we have contributed to these issues, and we, we need your help to make things better, not, not just shoving all the responsibility on you. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Um, my name is Zina, and I'm from Israel. And my question is about media bias in general, but particularly through state-funded news agencies. Um, you know, Al Jazeera, Russia Today, TRT World, especially when they're talking about foreign conflicts, even, you know, Al Jazeera has come under scrutiny where they've said one thing in English, but then in a different language, they've said other things. So how are we as a generation that are looking at these um, news agencies that are supposed to be the credible and respected, um, you know, authority on news when 
you know, we're seeing that the information that they're putting out is also sort of like wobbling. Well, I think there is no single source, whether state funded or private funded, that is uh, objective or neutral. And we need to be very sort of, you know, critical about that. And um, I mean, I follow as many different uh, news channels as the, all the ones you mentioned. Obviously, you're not going to find critical documentaries about Turkey on TRT or about Qatar. But then even when it comes to France 24, you, you, you won't find certain stories, but you'll find them on uh, Al Jazeera. For example, you know, the stories about French involvement in certain procurement companies in different countries. So the most important thing for us is to lower our dependency on one source. First of all, not believing any source. Not believing any source. And not sticking only to one source. And to have your worldview uh, disturbed by different sources and different narratives and different versions. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll end up with just one. Not one single source will give you the complete, the complete picture. You have to create it. You have to be the editor. I know Julia said you're not editors, but as consumers, we are editors. We edit the information uh, that we get, and we must not depend only on one, on one source. And thus, the questions, as have been asked, the role of vested interest in shaping news, not just bias, the role of vested interest. Because we say oh, prejudice, even eyewitness accounts. There's a whole study on the psychology of eyewitness accounts. Even if we watch the same incident, traffic incident, we will report it differently, let alone much more complex things that go on. So what the most important thing is actually to, be, to get as many different versions as possible and try to build your own information. Ricardo, you want? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you, Evaristo, but coming back to the question, I think, I think that it would be important for the media to be more transparent yes. about their ownership. Complete. So Complete. as citizens, Complete. we have the right to know yes. who owns the media. Complete. And that's not the case in, in, in many countries, yes. even in the European Union. Yes, yes. That's part of the uh, new... I, I, I wonder, Ricardo, whether, because this is an issue that we have not discussed, what level of protection do have journalists have from the interference of proprietors, from owners. Once upon a time, it was possible, even in Scandinavian countries, that as a journalist, you, ca you could object to reporting against your a own, story yeah. against your own owner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that, is, that has become very crucial. I'm in a privileged position to say I work for an organization where nobody butts into my affairs. So. <laughs> Maria? So you're more responsible <laughs> for what you do. Mar Maria Pisani, academic and activist from Malta. And I'm going to speak in response to, I'm Generation X, I'm feeling like a boomer today. <laughs> I had downloaded TikTok, spent an hour on it, said, yeah, I don't get this, and take, I took it off. <laughs> but I just reinstalled it now. Um, it's my generation that are in power, and the boomers. Um, and they're taking the decisions, they're lying, and they're getting away with it. They lie a lot, a lot. As an activist I, in Malta, um, and I've been active for probably too many years now, look, you guys in the room, if you're here, then you're probably privileged. You have relative privilege. In Malta, and Malta's no different to elsewhere, apart from horrific environmental destruction, we have racial profiling that is rife. Weeks ago, um, three police officers, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know the rank, members of the police force, were arrested for beating up black immigrants from Hamroon. Now, it sounds crazy to say this. I celebrate the fact that for the first time, the people that reported them were also members of the police force. Otherwise, I mean, we knew it was happening, but the migrants did not report what was happening because there is no trust and because this kind of abuse has been allowed to continue for at least two decades now. And the state is responsible for human rights violations, so they hold power, but as a generation, you do have power too, at least in your use of tech. And I, I mean, to be honest, I have four kids, two millennials, two Gen Zs, and I message them now, how many of you are using TikTok and how often do you use it? 
I'm clueless. I can remember once, about 12 years ago, we stopped a, a forced return um, to Libya. We've, we stopped it through, so we, through the law. We used European Court of Human Rights very, very quickly. But on that occasion, we were able to mobilize really, really quickly on Facebook. But I think Facebook has had its moment in Malta. That was my generation. That's not going to happen today. We've organized many protests over the years on, on racism. And generally speaking, we've been maybe 10, 12 people, if I bring my mom and dad along and force them to attend to. I mean, it was quite sad. Um, but then for Black Lives Matters, because it was a, a global movement, for the first time we had hundreds attending. So anyway, I guess my point is, yeah, there are people who um, perhaps share your values that um, are ready to say, we have been speaking out for too long, but we do need you. We do need the power that you hold because we're exhausted, I think, first of all. We need, and here I'll agree with Everest, we need hope, not cynicism, and, and we need to have this dialogue. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop for coffee. I'm really enjoying the session, by the way. This is really engaging, and even I'm learning from all the comments here. But I think uh, we can have a chat over coffee if you want, and then we'll come back with Janet's presentation. Thank you.